our speaker for today. Our presenter is Laura Davids. She is a licensed certified genetic counselor with Emory Healthcare in Atlanta. Sorry, I'm not sure why Atlanta just went out of my head. Um, so she's going to share with us today a little about the genetics and PD, and we will have this recorded, so we'll be able to put that up. You'll have access to it by the beginning of the week um, on the website. So with that, Laura, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with y'all so that we can get started. Is this good? Can we see? Okay, great. All right. It looks good. So, like Lauren said, my name is Laura Davids. I'm a genetic counselor. I practice in Atlanta, Georgia. And today I'm here to talk to you about the role of clinical genetics in understanding Parkinson's disease. So my goals for today are to first start off by just giving kind of a background overview of what genetics is, uh, different inheritance patterns, different key concepts so that we can all be talking about the same thing. Um, we'll talk about the known genetic contributions to Parkinson's, the process of a genetic workup, uh, talk about what the possible results of a genetics workup are, cover the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act and biobanking. And then after all of that, I will be really excited to answer any questions that I can that y'all have. So uh, I don't have any financial disclosures, uh, unfortunately, or conflicts of interest to share with you. Um, I am a genetic counselor, like I said before. I work in a general genetics clinic. I see, I would say about 85% of my patient population is pediatric, but I do see adult patients as well. I see pretty much anything. It's a general clinic, anything that walks through the door, any type of medical issue with a genetic basis. Um, I have a master's of medical science in human genetics and genetic counseling from the Emory University School of Medicine. And despite all of these Georgia affiliations that I'm talking about right now, I grew up in Greenville. Uh, so I'm from Greenville, and the way that I first learned about GAPS was actually a few years ago, a dear friend of mine, his uh, father had Parkinson's disease, and GAPS was incredibly helpful to that whole family, um, especially as he started declining, and Cameron even came to his funeral, and it was uh, really wonderful and touching for all of us. So I'm so honored to be here today to talk to you about what I know about. So um, what is a genetic counselor? <laughs> there are about five to 6,000 of us in the United States. So it's totally okay if you've never heard of it before, most people haven't. Uh, what genetic counselors do is we work with families who either have a family member with a genetic condition or suspected genetic condition. We go through family history and medical history to try to figure out what we think is going on. We decide what the most appropriate type of genetic test is, consent the family to the testing, we interpret the results when, we, when they come back, and then we share the results with the family. Um, and when it is a difficult result, we do crisis counseling in the moment and service support for families going through difficult times. We work with geneticists, medical geneticists, doctors, uh, when we are in general genetic settings, but genetic counselors function independently in cancer settings and in prenatal settings, we work very closely uh, with OBGYNs. All right, so let's get into it. I'm gonna start off by just talking a little bit about what exactly I'm gonna cover. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you what Parkinson's disease is, all of you know. I'm sure that you know many more details than I do about what it's like to live with someone who has Parkinson's disease. But when we talk about Parkinson's disease in the medical community, sometimes it gets a little bit confusing because there can be quite a bit of overlap in terminology that's used. So this little chart right here is just showing lots of different things uh, from a genetics perspective that people can be talking about when we're trying to talk about Parkinson's. I'm only going to be talking about right here, Parkinson's disease. We're not gonna cover Parkinsonism or we're not gonna cover some of the um, dementias that can have Parkinsonism. We're just gonna talk about Parkinson's disease. So the reason that genetics is even involved with Parkinson's disease is because 15% of individuals who have Parkinson's disease have a positive family history, meaning there's someone else in the family history who's had Parkinson's disease. This means that there is some type of genetic component to Parkinson's disease. 
So when we think about this from a genetics perspective, there are a few subtypes that we break Parkinson's disease down into. We talk about familial Parkinson's disease, which is what I just mentioned when there's a positive family history. When there's no positive family history, no one else in the family has been diagnosed with Parkinson's, we call that sporadic Parkinson's disease. Then when someone has Parkinson's disease, we can break it down based on age of onset. So in the genetics community, when we see someone who has onset of symptoms before age 20, we say that it's juvenile onset PD. Between ages 20 and 50, we typically call it early onset adult PD. And after age 50, we call it late onset adult PD. There's a little bit more information on here that I promise will make sense once I get a little further in the presentation. Um, but these terms, autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, multifactorial, are terms that refer to how different genetic conditions are inherited. So there are different inheritance patterns and based on the age of onset, based on family history, we can be more or less suspicious for certain types of inheritance patterns. So that brings me to genetics. So in general, when I'm talking about our genetic information, I'm talking about the instruction manual that tells our body how to form and how to develop. We have our entire genetic instruction manual in every single cell of our body. The instructions themselves are packaged into chromosomes and that's what we inherit from our parents. So most people have 46 chromosomes that are arranged in 23 pairs. We get one copy in each pair from our biological mother and the other copy in each pair comes from our biological father. When we unwrap those chromosomes, what we see are the individual genes, which are each specific instruction. And the genes are written in their own alphabet, which is what we call DNA. It's made up of four letters, A, T, G, and C. And the order in which those letters are arranged is the specific instruction that tells the body how to create most of the time a protein, not the type that we eat, but a protein that carries out work in the body. So when we do genetic testing for Parkinson's disease, there are so many different types of genetic tests and I'm not gonna get into that. I'm just gonna talk about what's relevant to Parkinson's disease. We look at specific genes that we know are associated. So a genetic test reads the way that the gene is spelled. It reads the arrangement of those four letters. And it tells us if there is a spelling difference, a spelling change that we weren't expecting to see. So when we get a spelling difference we weren't expecting to see, we have to figure out, does that difference cause problems or is it just normal human variation? All of us have slightly different instruction manuals, which is a very good thing that's important. It allows us to be unique, different from one another. So sometimes we get a spelling change and we don't know, does that spelling change cause problems or is it just something that runs in my family that makes us who we are? And we'll come back. Oh, actually, we'll go straight to that concept right now. So when we do a genetic test, there are three possible results we can get. We can get a positive result where there is a spelling change, a typo, a pathogenic variant, a mutation, all different words used to describe that. I'm going to stick with typo for this talk. We can get a negative result where we don't see any harmful or suspicious spelling changes. And we can get the variant of uncertain significance, which is where we know there's a spelling difference there, but maybe we haven't seen it enough times to know if it causes problems or not, or we don't know what impact it actually has on the protein to know if it causes issues or not. When we get a result like this, which happens pretty frequently, we have some tricks that we can use to try to figure out what it means. We can test other family members that might be informative. I spend a lot of time looking through different genomic databases and reading papers to try to figure out what different variants of uncertain significance mean. But it's important to talk about this because genetic testing is not always a straightforward yes or no answer. There is some uncertainty that comes along with it. So when we do a genetic test and we find a spelling difference, the impact of that spelling difference of that typo is different based on what gene it's in and based on the typo itself. So we can see single gene causes, which are where we get a typo 
in a gene that we know can cause Parkinson's disease and can be passed down from generation to generation. We can see typos that we call risk alleles, which is where there's a spelling difference in a gene that increases the likelihood of developing a condition, but it doesn't always lead to the condition and more often than not, it doesn't lead to the condition. Then we can get what are called multifactorial contributions. So these are little spelling differences that by themselves don't really do much of anything. But when you combine them with other spelling differences and other genes and other environmental factors, we can see increased risk. And that's called multifactorial inheritance and I'm gonna describe it again in a minute. Um, but with multifactorial inheritance, we can still see these things running in families, right? Because we share many, many genes with our family members. And we also often share environmental factors with family members as well. So to kind of drive this concept home a little bit more that not all typos cause the same types of problems, this is a little graph that I think does a good job of kind of showing the difference. So on this axis, we have what the impact of the spelling change, the typo is, as it relates to causing disease. So does the typo pretty much lead to disease? Is that a really high impact? Or does the typo by itself not really do much of anything, low impact? Then also, how common is this spelling change? Is it very rare? We're only seeing it in like one or two families? Or is it really common? It's something that we see in a lot of people. When we do genetic testing right now, we are really good at identifying these types of changes. When we see a very rare change that we can prove causes the gene to not function well, we have a genetic explanation. We're good at that. We are learning how to do this part right now. It's really hard to prove that a common variant can cause problems. You have to have studies of millions and millions and millions of people. So we're gonna come back to this a little bit later, kind of talking about what types of changes fall into these different categories. So now I wanna talk a little bit about penetrance. So earlier, right here, I said, a change in gene can cause Parkinson's, not necessarily that it will cause Parkinson's. The concept of whether or not a change will cause a disease is what we call penetrance. And it's basically just how many people who have this typo actually develop the disease. So the proportion of people with the genetic variant or mutation who develop the condition. So if there are people who have the typo who don't develop the condition, we say that it's incomplete or reduced penetrance. So in this little diagram right here, let's say all of these people have a spelling change. So in the case of complete penetrance, all of them have the spelling change, all of them develop the condition. Incomplete penetrance, all of them have the spelling change, but only some of them develop the condition. So in this right here, two thirds of people develop the condition. So I would say the penetrance of this is like 66% from this diagram. Now that's not really based on anything. It just looked nice on the slide. So that's why I went with 66%. But you can see that even when we get a result, if we understand what the result means, it doesn't necessarily mean that a person will develop a disease. All right, so finally, I wanna talk about different inheritance patterns. So earlier I said that the like later adult onset and some of the early adult onset Parkinson's disease that we see when there's a genetic explanation is inherited in a dominant way. And I also said that we all have two copies of pretty much every chromosome that we get one from mom and one from dad. So because we have two copies of those chromosomes, we have two copies of pretty much every single gene in our body. So with dominant inheritance, you can see here in this diagram, these represent a working gene and then a non-working gene. So the non-working gene has a typo that causes it to not work properly. In this scenario, the dad in the family has one working copy and one non-working copy. That's enough to put them at risk, even though they still have one working copy. Every time this person has a child, they're gonna pass on one of these two copies. When we conceive a pregnancy naturally, we have no control over that. It happens completely randomly. There are assisted reproductive technologies. Um, one people commonly have heard of is IVF or in vitro fertilization. 
when we do that, we can change this. But in general, we say the risk for someone who has a dominant condition to pass it on is 50% because it's 50% if they're going to pass on the working copy or the non-working copy. So what's important to think about with dominant inheritance is this means it doesn't our, our, whether someone is a male or a female does not impact the likelihood of them inheriting the dominant gene, the dominant variant from their parent. We see this go from generation to generation, but also if we know there's a dominant variant in a family and we test a family member and they don't have that variant, it means that they can't pass it on to their children because we can't pass on what we don't have. So those are some of the things to think about with dominant inheritance. Now, the extremely early onset cases of PD that we see that have a genetic basis typically have recessive inheritance. So in this situation, again, we've got two copies of the gene. And in order to actually have the condition, a person has to have both copies of the gene not be working. So they have to have typos in both copies of the gene. For that to happen, both parents typically have one working copy and one non-working copy. For most recessive conditions, a person who has one working and one non-working copy doesn't have symptoms. We call them a carrier. Everyone is a carrier of something. Every single one of us on this Zoom call is a carrier of something. That is totally normal. We just most of the time don't find out about it unless we do genetic testing or we end up having a child with someone who's a carrier of the same condition, which is what's happening in this diagram. So every single time these two people have a child together, there is a 25% or one in four chance that the child has the condition. There's a 50% chance, these two right here, that the child gets one working and one non-working copy in this carrier, just like their parents. And then there's a 25% chance or one in four that the child does not have the condition and is not a carrier, that they just inherited both working copies. With recessive inheritance, this is something that we don't normally see moving from generation to generation because both parents have to be carriers. So normally we see multiple affected individuals in the same generation. And finally, we are back to multifactorial inheritance. So this one I think is helpful to think about as if we have a jar and it's full of marbles. And if the marbles overflow from the jar, a person develops the condition. The marbles are many different things. So it can be our genetic makeup, little changes in many different genes, some of which increase risk to develop a condition and some of which are protective against developing a condition. Then we have environmental factors that again can be protective or can, can be harmful that can increase risk. So these are things that I'm sure again, y'all know much more about than I do, but things like different environmental exposures of toxins or head trauma, protective things being treating ourselves well like we all should be doing anyways, eating well and exercising. So that's multifactorial inheritance. We can't test for this right now. Uh, give me like 10, 20 years, hopefully I'll be saying something different, but genetics and our technology is just not smart enough to do this quite yet. But that's the way things are going. So that was our little background primer on lots of different genetics concepts. Genetics is complicated. Um, in general, we don't learn a much, a, as much about it as I'm very biased, but I think we should uh, in our general education. So it's totally okay if you don't fully grasp all of that on the first go around. And I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. But now I wanna talk a little bit more specifically about genetics and Parkinson's disease. So the first genetic cause of Parkinson's disease was identified in 1996. That's really not that long ago in the grand scheme of all things medical. As of right now, we have identified over 20 genes that would fit into that category of a single gene cause of Parkinson's or a strong risk allele. And then, as of 2019, we had identified over 90 risk signals. So these are like the really small changes that would be involved in multifactorial inheritance. And I can tell you that over 90 risk signals does not even come close to finding all of the risk signals that we know that we have. <laughs> 
So when we do clinical medical genetic testing, there are two different avenues that this can go down with respect to Parkinson's disease. So when we see an individual who has Parkinson's disease, who is symptomatic, and maybe they had a really early age of onset, or maybe they've got a concerning family history, we can combine all of those single gene causes that we know about into one test. So I looked at about four or five different genetic testing companies that my clinic uses to see what the content of their multi-gene panels for Parkinson's disease was. And all of them had between about 20 and 30 genes on those panels. So we don't, we used to have to think like, okay, I think it's this one specific gene and we would test gene by gene by gene, which is not an efficient way to do that time-wise or money-wise, but technology has advanced and now we can test them all at the same time. So that's what we do for a person who has Parkinson's disease and we're concerned that there is a monogenic or single gene cause. The other type of clinical genetic testing that can be done for Parkinson's disease is what's called predictive testing. And this is for people who do not have Parkinson's disease. This is for people who have a family member who does. What we do here is typically the person who is affected has genetic testing. If that person, if we are able to identify a genetic explanation for their Parkinson's disease, we can then offer targeted testing to other family members who are at risk, where we just look to see if they inherited that typo or not. And we can get a yes or no answer from that. We don't deal with variants of uncertain significance when we do targeted variant testing. So this is complicated. Um, in many different ways, it's complicated from a genetics perspective, but it's also really complicated just from a life perspective. There's a lot to think about before doing genetic testing. Unfortunately, there is not a standardized practice guideline for genetic testing and genetic counseling with Parkinson's disease. There are a couple of working groups that are working on it, uh, but we don't have it right now. So what most practitioners do is we use models from other genetic conditions that are neurological and have adult onset. So the practice guidelines that people most often draw from are for Alzheimer's disease and are for Huntington's disease. Those are the ones that we kind of emulate when we are doing genetic testing. And I will talk about that in a second. Sorry, I forgot the order of my slides. Um, so I want to talk to you about a few of the genes that are on these multi-gene panels. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, honestly, a lot of them have only been identified in like one or two families, but I wanna talk to you about four of the most commonly known genes. So first up over here, I have the names of the genes. Every single gene name is a combination of letters and numbers, and normally it stands for kind of whatever the function of the protein that it creates in the body is. Right here, I have the different inheritance patterns of these genes. So we've talked about dominant inheritance, we've talked about recessive inheritance, we've talked about risk alleles. So let's start with LRK2. And I wanted to start with this one because this is the most frequently most frequently identified known cause of Parkinson's disease in individuals who have late onset Parkinson's disease or sporadic Parkinson's disease. So of that group of people, one to 2% of them have a typo in this gene. Now genetics also does this interesting thing where sometimes depending on a, per on a person's background where their family is originally from, we can see different risk numbers. So for LRRK2 specifically, for individuals who have North African Berber ancestry, who have Parkinson's disease, 41% of them have a typo in this gene. For individuals who have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and have Parkinson's disease, we've seen different studies saying between 13 and 30% of them have a typo in this gene. And this gene was only discovered in 2004, so we've got a lot more to learn about it. There are a wide, wide range of different penetrance numbers. Remember, penetrance is the likelihood that you develop the condition if you have the typo. But the highest penetrance numbers that I saw for this gene were between 67 to 75 percent. Honestly, this is probably a little bit of an overestimate, but that's one of the numbers that we currently quote right now. Next, we have SNCA, 
wanted to talk about this one because this is the first one that we ever learned about. We learned about it in 1996. It's also associated, it's dominant, and it's associated with earlier onset Parkinson's disease. We don't have any specific numbers for specific populations. Um, this gene does have the highest penetrance out of the dominant genes. It can be as high as 85% penetrant. And something that's interesting about this gene is that when someone has Parkinson's disease caused by this gene, we typically see a more rapid progression of disease than we see with someone who has Parkinson's disease due to other causes. Next up, we have GBA, which was first linked to Parkinson's disease in 2009. So again, fairly new. This is a risk allele. So the penetrance number is a little bit different. There's a general population risk of developing Parkinson's disease that just every human on earth has. If you have this risk allele, we say that your risk is somewhere between six and 10 times higher than the general population risk to develop Parkinson's. So overall, we think that this is present in about three to 7%, so a fair amount in the world of genetics, uh, three to 7% of adult onset Parkinson's disease. And it's most often with that late onset Parkinson's disease, because again, this is a risk allele. This has a lot lower penetrance. It, it uh, causes fewer problems than the other types of changes. Like LRRK2, we actually see this more frequently in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. So again, individuals who are Ashkenazi Jewish and have Parkinson's, 20% of them have this risk allele. Something interesting about GBA is Parkinson's is not actually the primary genetic condition that it's associated with. It's associated with a recessive condition called Gaucher disease that's very different. It's a lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, we see symptoms beginning in childhood. Uh, but what this means is when we see a kid who has Gaucher disease, that means their parents, because it's recessive, probably carriers GBA, which means the parents might have increased risk to develop Parkinson's. And finally, I want to talk about PRKN. This gene was one of the first ones to be discovered in 1998. And what's different about this gene as opposed to these other ones is that it is recessive inheritance. So this is where both copies of the gene have typos. Recessive, like I said earlier, is most commonly associated with the earlier onset forms of Parkinson's disease. So this gene, we see two typos in it in about for about five to 10% of individuals with early onset Parkinson's disease. So over here, I've written that it has complete penetrance. So what that means, and this is true of most recessive conditions, is that if you have two typos, one in each copy of the gene, you're gonna have the condition because we don't have a backup copy to help us out. That being said, it's recessive. We expect parents to be carriers, have one working and one non-working copy. We at this time don't really know how or if this increases risk for those carriers. So those are four of the most common genetic causes of Parkinson's or most well-described ones anyways. When we do genetic testing, because what we're doing is those multi-gene panels, we don't normally talk about all of the genes in detail before ordering the testing because it's just too much. We wait and see if we come back with something on the genetic testing, and then we go into a lot of detail about the gene. Okay, so let's talk a little bit again about multifactorial causes and where things are going. So we think based on these huge, huge, huge meta-analysis studies that have been done, that common genetic variants, so if you think back to that graph, it's the ones in the bottom right-hand corner, common genetic variants are thought to explain about 22% of the heritability of Parkinson's disease. We have identified, like I said, 90 risk signals, which only account for a very, very small fraction of that 22% that we know is caused by common genetic variants. So we've got a lot of work to do there. That's why we can't do multifactorial testing. Well, one of the reasons we can't do multifactorial testing at this time is we just haven't identified them. So the way that genetics is going, not just with regards to Parkinson's disease, but with regards to other common conditions like Alzheimer's, 
heart disease is a big one, is we are working on identifying those small genetic contributions, so these little bits of DNA, to multifactorial inheritance. We're doing that by discovering susceptibility genes and risk loci, which are just some fancy words for those little risk signals that we talked about. We can't test for it right now, but in the future, once we have that capability, what's going to happen, hopefully, is something called polygenic risk scores. So with common diseases, the ultimate goal, and really we've, we're the furthest along with this with common cardiology issues. But what we do is you test a person, very broad genetic testing, and get lots of information about lots of changes and lots of different genes and combine all of those together to get a polygenic risk score, which tells us how at risk a person is of developing whatever condition the polygenic risk score is for. Again, check back with me 10, 20 years. This is a, a ways down the line, but I just want you to know where things are going. Okay, this is what I thought I was gonna talk about next earlier, um, how there are no formal practice guidelines for genetic testing and genetic counseling for Parkinson's disease. So we draw from Huntington's and Alzheimer's guidelines of what to do. And it's different in the case of individuals who have symptoms and are already affected versus individuals who are just at risk based on family history. So for individuals who are symptomatic, one of the recommendations because this testing really impacts many, many members of the family, is that the counseling, the genetic counseling that's performed before this testing is ordered, is done with whatever family members are going to be impacted by the result. This is a family affair, so we want to have everyone involved. With symptomatic individuals, we normally do those multi-gene panels as far as testing goes. And there's the chance that we can get a variant of uncertain significance and not know what it means. With predictive testing, what's recommended, so again, predictive testing is people who do not have Parkinson's, but maybe their parent does and they wanna know what their risk is. We recommend counseling, genetic counseling before the test is ordered and when the results are given. We recommend identifying support for that individual Sometimes we want to do a neurologic examination if we're worried a person already has symptoms, just so we can get a baseline. I'm not a doctor. I'm a genetic counselor. That's not something genetic counselors can do, but that's a way in which we work closely with doctors and physician's assistant and nurse practitioners to do these things. There's also, because this person doesn't have a genetic condition at this point in time before we do any predictive testing, some life things that we need to talk about. We need to think about how does this impact insurance? How does this, how does this just impact my life at large? So this is a little flow chart from the Alzheimer's guidelines that were put out by the American College of Medical Geneticists. So that's the genetic organization for the doctors, the geneticists, and the National Society of Genetic Counselors, which is the national organization for people like me, genetic counselors. So in people who are symptomatic, we recommend a neurological examination. Then we do genetic counseling and risk evaluation. If based on the information that we gather from family history and medical history, we think that there's a chance this could be something we can find a single gene cause for, we'll do genetic testing. These are just the three genes that cause Alzheimer's. So that's not important. That's just part of the chart. And then we counsel once we get the results. We follow up, we can do predictive testing if we get a positive answer. For people who it looks more sporadic, it looks like we're not really finding an explanation, what we normally recommend is DNA banking, which I'll explain, and genetic research, whatever is available. And I will also talk about a little bit of that that's going on. If we get a negative result when we do the genetic testing, we still talk about biobanking and we still talk about what research is going on. Now, when we see someone who doesn't have Parkinson's disease and they're there for predictive testing, we do predictive testing if we know what change is running in the family. So we have to identify a change in the family before we can test someone who's not affected. And I'll explain why. But we recommend genetic counseling, risk evaluation. Sometimes, depending on what we're talking about, we'll recommend a psychiatric evaluation. Sometimes we want a neurological baseline evaluation. Then we do the genetic testing for the known variant. We counsel with the results and we just support with follow-up. So the reason that we 
start genetic testing with someone who's actually affected. Most of the time, we don't find an answer on genetic testing. So if we see someone who has a family history but does not have Parkinson's disease and they wanna get testing and we did that multi-gene panel on them, we come back with a variant of uncertain significance. We don't know what to do. If we come back with a positive result, then we say, okay, we know what your risk is. This is very likely what the affected family member in your family had too. But if we come back with a negative result, I don't know if the test is negative because there is something we could have picked up in the affected individual and my patient didn't inherit it and that would put them at general population risk. That's what's called a true negative. We don't know if that's the case. It could be that we wouldn't have been able to identify the genetic explanation in this family and the person who's affected would have had a negative genetic test. So if the affected person would have had a negative genetic test, the unaffected person's negative genetic test doesn't tell me if we just can't identify it or if they didn't inherit it, which is a really frustrating place to be. So when we do predictive testing, this is a quote that's pulled from those Alzheimer um, genetic testing guidelines. But when we do genetic testing, predictive genetic testing, there's a lot that we need to talk about. I need to know why you wanna do the testing. What would this change in your life if you found out that you're at increased risk to develop Parkinson's? What would it change about your life if you found out that you're just at general population risk? Are you doing this because you're about to have children and you wanna know? Are you doing this because you're about to get married and you wanna be able to talk about it openly? Are you doing this because you want to make career decisions based on this information? How are you gonna handle a positive result? How are you gonna handle a negative result? That's where the counseling comes in. And that's where we sit down and have a nice long talk about the pros and the cons and everything that comes along with it. And as part of that discussion, one of the things that we talk about is how this affects us legally. So now I'm gonna talk about the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA. It was passed in 2008 and it's a federal law and it really didn't start going into effect until 2009, but it is legislation that protects us from genetic discrimination from health insurance and from employment. So this means that health insurance companies cannot use a genetic test result as a reason to deny you health insurance or determine what the cost of your coverage is going to be. It also means that employers cannot use genetic testing results or family history really to make any hiring, firing, promotion decisions at all. GINA is fantastic, um, but there are loopholes. There are things it doesn't cover. Um, one of them is that this employment protection does not apply if there are fewer than 15 employees at a company. So if you work for a very small organization that has fewer than 15 employees, GINA does not protect you against your employer using that information to decide whether or not to promote you or hire you or fire you. Some other things that GINA does not apply to, it does not apply to life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. So with these, what we recommend when we see someone for predictive testing before we do the testing is just that they make sure they have the policies in place that they want before we go ahead and do the testing. Because that way, when the insurance companies ask you, you know, what's your risk? You can say, I don't know, I haven't had testing. Also, GINA does not apply to members of the US military, veterans who receive care at the VA, certain federal employees and individuals who use Indian health services. They, all of those organizations have essentially their own version of GINA that's very similar, but GINA doesn't apply to them. Something else is that if someone already has a condition, so if someone already has Parkinson's, GINA does not prevent a health insurer from using that because it's a genetic condition as discrimination against deciding whether or not they're gonna cover you or what your premium is gonna be. Currently, the Affordable Care Act with um, protecting against discrimination for pre-existing conditions covers that. Each state has their own individual laws as well. Um, I'm not as familiar with South Carolina's, even though I'm from South Carolina, just because I don't practice in South Carolina. But in general, most of them are fairly similar to GINA. 
So either you have the protections that Gina gives you, or you have more protections than that if your state has more protections in place. So that's Gina. Now I want to uh, wrap up by talking about DNA banking or biobanking. So earlier I said when we get a negative result for a symptomatic individual, or when there's someone who we don't think genetic testing right now would really have a high yield for, we recommend biobanking of DNA. The company that we normally recommend is one called Prevention Genetics. Um, it's pretty easy to find online. And what this is, is something that you can actually do without a doctor's order. This is something that you order yourself. And you collect a sample from a person who is affected with the condition and store that sample in a biobank. That way, I keep saying, you know, let me know, or I'll let you know in like 20 years where we're at. This is the possibility that a symptomatic individual who's no longer with us in 20 years, that we're still able to do genetic testing on their sample. Because like I explained earlier, we want to do genetic testing on someone who's actually affected if we don't know what the cause is in the family. So the goal with biobanking, and this is something we recommend for many different conditions, is that we'll be able to have a sample available sometime in the future once genetics has learned more. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of different resources now. Um, on the next slide, I have some links to just good family-friendly, patient-friendly information about the genetics of Parkinson's if you're interested in reading a little bit more. And I also wanted to see what I could find about availability of genetic testing. So I can tell you that this does need to be ordered by a medical provider can be ordered by a genetic counselor in the state of Georgia. I'm actually not sure about South Carolina. It can be ordered by a doctor. So if this is something you're interested in, first up, as always, talk to your doctor. They might be willing to do it themselves. They might know of a genetic counselor in the area. If you're looking for a genetic counselor, there is a website called findageneticcounselor.org, which shows you where we are and what we specialize in. And then I found something really cool that I hadn't known about before I was preparing for this presentation that I've included right here. So this is through the Parkinson's Foundation and it's called PD Generation, Generation, very cute. Um, and what this is, is a research study essentially where at no cost people are able to receive people who are affected are able to receive genetic testing and genetic counseling. It looks like they do this in person um, or it can be done from home through telemedicine. It's just a simple cheek swab. So if you go to their website, you can find more information about this, but that is a really um, easy, low cost way to get genetic testing right now. And something else I wanna say is Genetic testing has this reputation of being insanely expensive, and it used to be insanely expensive, but I can tell you now, for some of the labs that we use in my clinic on a daily basis, not going through insurance, you can have some of these genetic tests done for $250 or less. So it's still expensive, but it is not the thousands and thousands of dollars that it used to be. And these are the links I was talking about of just good places to learn a little bit more information about genetics and Parkinson's disease together. And these are my references. And now I would be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Go ahead and stop your sharing just so we can have everybody back on the screen. Yes, that was a lot of information. <laughs> and you speak it as if, you know, you speak it every day. Um, so I'm sure some of it for all of us was a little, uh, a little overwhelming, if it's not the world that we live in. Um, but a lot of really good things. We just had a member who did get testing. Um, and one of the things he said was, we need more people who aren't affected to get testing to see. Can you speak to that a little bit. I wasn't sure, he wasn't really able to articulate that any further either. Yeah, so those numbers, basically all of those risk numbers that I was able to give you came from really large studies that have thousands and thousands of people in them. So the way that we learn more about 
genetics is by performing genetic testing on people who are affected and people who are unaffected on a research basis. That's what creates these databases that allow me to figure out if a typo causes problems or doesn't cause problems. So that's my guess of what they would have been talking about, that we just need more people to have testing so that our databases can be better, so that we can understand more. Um, another thing that uh, is a good reason for more people to get tested and be involved in this research is that most of our databases have predominantly individuals of European ancestry in them. So we know more about the genetics of individuals with European ancestry, but we want this to apply to everyone all over the world with all different types of ancestry. So we also really want individuals who have any type of background that's not European to get involved with these studies. Uh, there's one called All of Us uh, that specifically focuses on making sure we have more genetic diversity in the those databases. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Um, at this time, I know everyone's muted. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, just go ahead and hold the space bar and mute yourself. Does anybody have questions for Laura? And I just want to echo what Lauren said, that this is super complicated. It takes multiple visits with us for most of our patients to understand all of these intricacies. So there are no silly questions at all. I had to go to school for two years just learning about this to be able to talk about this. Go ahead, John. I got here a little bit late, so I'm sorry if I missed something. Um, question is, are you able to rewrite those typos or correct them in the gene code? So that's a great question. Um, there are a few different ways to answer that. The short answer is right now, no. Uh, but in the future, hopefully, yes. There is a procedure, a medication almost is kind of a strange word to use for it called gene therapy where when we have identified a single gene cause of a disease, we are able to use different ways of inserting the proper instructions into a person's body, hoping that those instructions replace the instructions that aren't working, and then the person conceivably would be able to produce what they need to produce on their own. Research on this is just starting. Um, there are clinical trials that are going on for many different diseases. And honestly, that's one of the reasons a lot of people have genetic testing for conditions like Parkinson's disease is so that if they have one of these genetic explanations that they're eligible for these types of research trials. And a good place to look for research trials that are currently going on like that is clinicaltrials.gov. But that is kind of the ultimate goal of a lot of the genetic testing. Because right now, when I give a diagnosis, most of the time I have to tell a family, there's no cure for this. We're just gonna have to treat it symptomatically. But now I have some information about what type of issues we might encounter and what we need to do. John again. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, not all the information I know about that prior to that is off of the Jurassic Park, you know, when they said, okay, we're <laughs> But insert these, and you're gonna get this kind of dinosaur. But, <laughs> but um, my family, on, the, on my paternal, no, maternal father's side, um, surprisingly, you know, my, my grandfather has Parkinson's. Then I found out later on that my aunt, my mother's sister, had Parkinson's. And then soon after that, I found out that there are about, uh, I don't know, 15 to 20 different cousins, first and second, third cousins, who all had Parkinson's as well. And um, just kind of wondering how we go about figuring out what's going on there, you know, since it's affected the family so heavily. Mm -hmm. So with a family history that strong, I would definitely say it's worthwhile to consider genetic testing. Uh, like I said, we like to start with a person who is affected. So we would start with testing someone in the family who has Parkinson's disease. Uh, what I would recommend is talking to their doctor to see if they would be able or willing to order the genetic testing and provide genetic counseling or know of somewhere they can refer them to to do that. Um, another good option for your family, I think, might be that, that uh, research study that I mentioned through um, the Parkinson's Foundation, the PD Generation. 
where they're able to do no cost genetic testing and counseling. But the first step would be just getting in to talk to a genetic counselor where they would do a detailed family history, figure out who the best people to test would be and go from there. I don't know of any family history with uh, Parkinson's, but I uh, early in my working career, I got exposed to a particular chemical which has shown up in searches I've done online. Mm -hmm. I recognize that doesn't quite fit with what you've been discussing, but can you give me any advice? So it does actually. The multifactorial inheritance that I was talking about, how we think it's lots of little genetic factors and lots of little environmental factors all interacting together. A chemical exposure if it's something that we you know, have studied and know is linked to Parkinson's, would fall into multifactorial because it's an exposure, it's part of the environment. But that's not something that would be passed down. So does that uh, go back to the thought of what we were told originally when we were diagnosed was that, uh, what is it, uh, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, that's multifactorial inheritance right there. Okay, so that, they kind of look at it that way. Because um, mm -hmm. I, I know like in my family side, I'm early onset, was early onset. Most of the rest of my family that I know of, you know, they're much later in onset, you know, at least past their 50s. Whereas I was around, you know, early 40s or 40 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see variability with age of onset in families all the time. Just because you have, let's say, the same change as someone else in the family, it doesn't mean that it will impact you in the same ways. That has to do with penetrance, which we talked about. Um, and it also has to do with some other concepts that we didn't talk about, but just that show even though someone has the same change as someone else, they might present differently. Well, we are... Just about. Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, John. Last question. Okay. Are we are you able to speak to the thought of biotherapeutics versus other remedies or, or other treatments that are going on now? Uh, I hear that term biotherapeutics. How the, how that differs. So that's a little bit outside of my scope. I really mainly deal with just genetics, um, but I can tell you that there are lots of clinical trials and studies that are going on to see how a person's genetic makeup impacts their response to different types of therapies. But that is a better question for, for your doctor. Well, Laura, thank you so much uh, for your time and certainly all of your knowledge and expertise in sharing that with us. Um, we, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is recorded, so we will have it um, for you to watch again, um, maybe and be able to um, have additional information. And if you have further questions, as always, um, you know, go ahead and reach out to us at GAPS. Um, we can get you connected and try to find resources for specific questions you may have. And, and certainly, as Laura said, and as we always say, um, one of the places to start is certainly with your doctor. Um, and if you have other questions about that, they maybe have a resource for you as well. So thank you again, everybody, for being here. Uh, and Laura, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me.